at the feet of the Nets. The Chicago Bulls with a couple of spectacular plays. There were a number of people that didn't want to be interviewed that said no thank you mm. to the request. Uh, people warned me in advance that Charles was going to be one of those guys. Yeah. But, you know, for my part, I still have to make the effort. Um, I did wrangle a phone number out of somebody to, to be able to call Charles. Mm. Um, I called him and I got him and I could hear. I guess I probably knew this, but it didn't really sink in for me until I called him. Um, I could hear the subway doors closing behind him. Mm when I called him and I'm like, Oh wow, this guy still lives in New York. Um, or he still at least is in the area, which I'm like, what a difficult place that has to be to live. Uh, if you're him specifically, just because, you know, for every person that tells John and John has said this before that he can't walk down the street without people telling him what the dunk means to them. Yeah. Uh, I get the impression that Charles lives that same reality, but in reverse, um, about, you know, he still gets heckled for game five. You know, thank God for fans like you that essentially realize that that's a painful moment, not only yeah. for you, but if it's a painful moment for you, imagine what it is for him. And so I can respect people that understand that and, you know, let people go about their day. A lot of people in Charles's circle told me nobody lets him forget that and that people come up to him and tell him mm. how he kind of ruined whatever chance they had at a title with, with that mm. play. And I'm like, what a horrible like Terrible, let people man. live, let people yeah, move yeah. on. You know, they're not, people are not necessarily their worst moments, certainly from an athletic perspective. Like it's not, you know, we have people that are doing horrible things in right, this world, right? Right. missing layups, you know, no matter how point blank there is not one of them. A- absolutely. He was trying, I, you know, I'd try to convey in the book how deeply he cared even before he got to the Knicks uh, with the Clippers that he was losing his hair uh, due mm. to the stress that he was feeling. He was averaging 20 mm. a game. He had already notched, you know, tied a franchise record for scoring in a game with the Clippers of 51 before he even made it to the Knicks, but that wow. he was losing patches of hair wow. through stress just wow. because he was like one of the faces of a horrible losing team and just the weight that that carried on him or put on his shoulders and he didn't like it. So this was a guy that cared very deeply. Um, and, you know, I write in the book that he, he got pulled over, you know, after the game. It was just a horrible day that – I'm sure nobody wants to relive that uh, if they don't have to mm. certainly him and nobody has let him forget it. So I, mm. something about the subway doors closing that day, he said he didn't want to talk. I said, look, man, I'm going to circle back to you to just kind of give you one more courtesy if you want to share your side of it. But I, I didn't expect to go into this writing a full chapter about Charles, mm. but um, I wanted to after a while, just because I kind of felt like it humanized him a little bit. It kind yeah. of explained where he came from, kind of how he got to that moment. But also, and I think, you know, one of the bigger critiques, it's not meant to critique him, but I just think it's meant to show how he operated as a coach. Pat Riley really didn't really didn't see a spot for Charles um, with this team, even from literally the first day of practice where he kind of was already questioning Charles's fit, you know, how big Charles was kind of size wise, weight wise. Mm. Because he was trying to make Charles a small forward yeah, when the guy was 6'10 three. or 6'11. Yeah. He was having him guard Scotty Pippen, and he needed him immediately to drop 20 pounds to be fleet of foot enough to guard Scotty. It's, it's like a, a guy that clearly today would be a center. Right, uh, right. But also, this is like maybe your most, aside from Patrick, maybe your most skilled offensive player. Mm. And you essentially are saying you can't make use of him. That was kind of what he was saying. Uh, Pat just, you know, everybody kept saying this. Like, Pat kind of drove the guy nuts psychologically like he you know the anecdote that i have in the book which has been out there before but you know i think the context was important um charles developed very chronic knee problems Mm -hmm. and it was something that the knicks either weren't aware of or didn't think was actually a legitimate injury for him so he had arthroscopic surgery during an off season then the season starts and his knees still don't feel right so like a month two months in he's saying like my knees are flaring up they hurt really bad so he gets another clean out and then he comes back and his knees are still bothering him that same season. And finally, some, at some point during the season, he's sitting out a game because his knees are bothering him still, even after two clean outs. And he walks into the locker room in a suit with the rest of his teammates already in the locker room. Uh, Pat is at the blackboard writing down some principles on the board and he's talking to the team. But then as Charles walks in, in his suit, he says, Charles, if I needed you to give me one minute tonight, 
And that one minute could result in us winning a championship. Could you give me that one minute? And Charles is kind of confused by the question. He's like, uh, of course, coach. Of course I would. And then he Riley says to him, then why the hell are you in that suit? Mm. Like, what the hell are you supposed to say to that? Like, he's put you in a catch-22 sort of situation. Um, because if you say, no, I can't do it, it makes you look like a wuss. Well, it makes you look really if you good. say, yes, I can do it, and you go out and play like you're not right physically. But you've also made it open season on one of your key guys. Like, you've made it okay for everybody to question his toughness mm. on a team where, like, granted, he's not the same as Oakley and – Certainly not McDaniel, the guy he replaced, and Mason and Starks and Doc and all those guys. But why is it such a problem for him to not be exactly the, like he's skilled? Like he can hit a 19 foot jumper, he can pass. Like he was five foot nine through his freshman or sophomore year of high school. He was a guard. He actually reminds me a lot just in terms of like the growth spurt, like somebody like Anthony Davis that went from being a wing player to being a, a, a big man. Um, like he, you needed his offense on a team like this, mm. but you kind of pigeonholed him into playing small forward and having to guard Scotty instead of just starting Mason maybe and using Smith off the bench so that you can use him with your bigs um, and, and use him as a big where he can kind of dominate and eat and really make guys come out and guard him. Right. Uh, so I felt like Riley, you know, to some extent, and Will Purdue said this, this was a guy that played with the Spurs later, mm -hmm. obviously was a bull, you know, during those first few years. Um, but he was teammates with Charles Smith in San Antonio. He was like, I talked to Charles enough to know that Riley just kind of psychologically damaged him. And there was nothing left. Like physically his knees were shot, but also just like mentally, like Riley did such a number on the guy in a way that like, I mean, I think he ruined him kind of. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff that Riley did and kind of said and the way he operated that I just don't think would fly. It certainly wouldn't fly in today's NBA. I mean, the guy told the team psychologist he couldn't see the players anymore mm -hmm. that would never fly in today's wow. mental health you know yeah, yeah uh focused nba but uh i thought charles smith was really important to focus on just because uh i do think he got a little bit of a raw deal um it's not to say he was a great player he wasn't but i do think that there were things that could have been done better that could have given him a better shot to work with the knicks and i do think that for some reason there was this emphasis on everybody having to, to be this guy that was like this executioner style guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think every single player, like you have role players and you have guys that fill certain roles. I don't think that guys like Charles need to be exactly the same as Oakley, for instance. I don't see that as a problem, but I think Riley did. I run into LJ all the time. You know, we, we'll chop it up on, on life. Doesn't even have to be about basketball. I run into stocks all the time. And, you know, I'll, I'll have that kid moment where I'm like, Oh man, it's my guy stocks. It's dunk. And then we'll, we'll chop it up on life. But Whenever I see Charles Smith, man, I still pity the guy, man. I don't know. I, 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 can't, I can't even strike up a conversation with him because I feel terrible. I get the flashbacks of the 93 series. Like, it, it is just so tough, uh, uh, you know, to, to even approach Charles Smith. 